Let's face it, when it comes to building UI these days, users have higher expectations than normal, or well, than they did in the past. And one of the common user interfaces that people are quite used to when it comes to managing data and interacting with the things that they have control over is the ability to drag and drop their data as they see fit. And if you've ever tried to build that on your own, you'll probably have the experience to realize that, well, it's kind of tricky. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, well, couldn't I just install like some third party app that takes care of that drag and drop functionality? Absolutely, you could. But as we all know, whenever you rely on third party libraries, it does mean that you're kind of at the whim of the maintainers. And more importantly, you don't necessarily own the code base. So unless you actually go in there and learn all the source code, which by the time you do that, you're basically learning how to build your own. It does mean you're kind of at the whim of the maintainers and more importantly, any bugs or if the bundle side gets really big, your application just kind of has to accept whatever comes with it. And so as we improve as software developers, one of the things we do to get better is we expose ourselves to different APIs, software architecture, and those things. And so in this course, what I want to do is we're going to be building the drag and drop from scratch using the native browser API so that in the event you come to the point where you're building some sort of enterprise application or something that you want really full control over that experience of drag and drop, well, this course will give you the foundation that you need in order to get started with that drag and drop functionality which is why we're doing it within the context of the Trello app, which for those who haven't used it before, is basically a Kanban board where you have different columns and then you drag your tasks between them, you can reorder them. and just a really visually appealing way that people like managing those things. And we're gonna use that as the context for building with the drag and drop API. With that said, welcome to the Build a Trello Clone with Nux3 course. My name is Ben Hong and I'm a Vue Core Team member, Nux ambassador and instructor here at Vue Mastery. In this course, we'll be building a Nux3 app from scratch using the new Nuxt UI component library in order to help scaffold our UI and just make design choices a lot easier. And then of course, we'll be building and learning about the drag and drop API so we can work with that from scratch. You can control all of that code from beginning to end. That said, to get the most out of this course, I highly recommend having familiarity with Vue 3 and Nuxt 3 fundamentals, how to write code with the composition API since that's how we'll be primarily be organizing our code within this app, as well as how to manage state management with Pinia, as well as utility CSS frameworks such as Tailwind CSS. That said, I'll try to cover everything at a high level as we're going through it, so it won't be completely new to anyone who's seeing it for the first time. But in case you want more foundational knowledge, be sure to check out some of our other resources. In addition, I want to also clarify that you don't need to know TypeScript for this course. You may see throughout the code base that we'll occasionally create a TypeScript file or maybe a Lang.ts, but the only reason we're doing that is to basically leverage some of the autocomplete and some of the type definitions just so we can see what's going on. But otherwise, no TypeScript needed to be successful with this course. All right, ready to jump into code? I'll see you in the next lesson where we officially kick off building our Trello clone with Nux3. To get started with our app, let's go ahead and set up a brand new Nux3 project. We'll be using npx in this case in order to basically use the Nuxy CLI command, which is a brand new Nux3 tool, if you haven't used it before. And that allows us to basically scaffold and initialize a brand new project. So we'll do npx Nuxy at latest. And the at latest basically ensures that the version of the package is latest one and nothing happens as far as npx points to some sort of local cache or some kind of weirdness that happens. Then from there, we get to pass in whatever command we might normally use to the Nuxy CLI. And in this case, we're doing the init command, which is initialize. And then we'll go ahead and do what? What do we got to do? Well, we're going to name the project. And so for me, it'll be build Trello clone with Nux3. Then it'll let you know, especially nowadays, what package manager are we going to use? Uh, in this case, I'm just going to use NPM because not everyone is using the other ones. But if you ever want to give those a try, feel free to check it out. So NPM is going to go ahead and do an install its thing. <laughs> And it's installing, this is what speed it up. Now that everything's installed, we're going to go ahead and initialize a new Git repository, since for me, this is a brand new Git repo. And then look, great, we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and change directly into our build Trello clone with Nux3. And then let's go ahead and clear the terminal so that's easier to read. And so it looks like we have everything. And let's go ahead and open it inside of VS Code. All right, our Nux3 project has been initialized. Let's go ahead and npm run dev, just to make sure everything's working as expected. So we see here Nux is starting up with Nitro on the back end. Localhost 3000 is up and running. So let's switch over to our browser and let's go ahead and refresh that Localhost 3000. And there you go. Everything looks like it's working and ready to go as far as next steps. All right, so what's next do we have? Well, 
Like with most of the applications that you build, especially when you're using Next3, you're going to have some sort of routing, right? People need to go to different pages. You want the URL to be able to change so that you can navigate to the right parts of your app. So as you can see here, in case you're new, Next3 doesn't start out with an actual view router. You might not have known that. And so actually, because it just has the app.view, it's really just a single page application at this point or an SPA. And so in order to initialize the routing part, all we got to do is we'll add a pages directory and we'll do an index.view, which basically represents the home page. So for those who are familiar with you know, standard deployments, this is essentially index.html. That's what's being served up on the root directory. And to make sure that works, all we got to do is replace the Nux welcome with a Nux page. And if you're wondering, Nux welcome, where's that coming from? That's just a built-in component to basically show some placeholder. Otherwise, Nux page basically says, hey, look, I'm going to be using a router. This is where I want you to display the route. And so now if we save this, we should see inside of here, good, Nitro is replaced and updated. And then what we got to do here, let's go ahead and I'm going to add a basic template here that says build a Trello clone homepage. And let's save. Jumping over into our app now. Now if we refresh. There we go. Everything looks exactly as expected. And so great, believe it or not, that's all it takes to set up routing within Nux3 is to basically make those swaps. Now to continue on as we set up the initial foundation of our project, we need to go ahead and set up Pinia as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check out the docs real quick for Pinia. And so you'll see here inside of Pinia, if we go ahead and go to the get started and inside of here, we'll take a look at the Nux here. Using Pinia with Nux does require additional installation. So in other words, in addition to installing Pinia, you need to install this Pinia Nux. So that's why I wanted to show you this within the docs so that you can look for that on your own in case you're ever working on another project. So I'm just going to copy this line and jump into our VS code. Inside of the terminal, let's go ahead and stop the local dev server. And this time we're going to go ahead and npm install Pinia and then the at Pinia slash Nux. What's essentially happening inside of here is that we're installing the Pinia library and then basically a compatible Pinia library that works well with Nux. Now, with a lot of things, if you're new to Nux3, basically what we got to do is we got to configure packages where we're using something with Nux, especially when there's some sort of Nux specific package. And the way we do that is inside of our Nux config. So inside of here, we're going to go ahead and add a modules configuration, and then we'll add our Pinia slash Nux. And so now that we have that, this is great. So let's go ahead and just set up a quick store to make sure everything is working. So the way we do that, we're going to open a stores folder. Since this is a Trello clone, we're going to be using like a board. So I'm going to call this a board store or store.ts. Remember the TS here is just for typing. We're not actually going to use any TypeScript in this file. So to create our board store, we're going to go ahead and import define store from Pinia. There we go. Yay, autocomplete. And then now that we have that, we can export a const of use board store, which is equal to define store. And then we pass the name of the store, which is the board store. And then we could use the object pattern of where we actually define like state. You might be familiar with this. We have like your state, your getters, and your actions, kind of like this model, right? This is really common. In fact, this is what most of us are used to when it comes to doing Vuex pattern and that kind of stuff. But in this particular course, we're going to be using the composition API pattern. And I know I said that kind of funny, but the composition API pattern. Anyhow, so what does that mean? So that means instead of just throwing an object at the store, we're basically going to have a function that returns an object. And so if we think about that just for a little bit, what that means is rather than just have an object that contains these sort of define options of state, getter, action. We're going to have a function that returns an object that can have that, but we can arrange our code accordingly. We'll see that in practice as we go throughout the course. So that said, how does this basically work? So if we want to have data, right, as far as placeholder data, when, especially when we're building and scaffolding a, a prototype, we're going to want to go ahead and create some sort of board data. So before we go ahead and define more about the store, let's go ahead and create that placeholder data. So what I generally like to do is inside my project, I'll create a data folder. And inside of here, this will contain some static JSON or whatnot so that it doesn't pollute the actual main store code. Because while we can certainly add placeholder code within the Pinia store, what we're basically doing is separating that so that in the future, we don't have like placeholder data. It's very easy to remove essentially. So I do board.json is what it's going to be. And then what we're going to do here is the JSON object is going to be an object, as I said before, and then a couple of properties. We're going to have the name of the board. So it'd be task board. And let me say that real quick. Great. It's formatting just as I want. And then what does the board have? Well, we're going to have some columns we need to deal with. And that can be an array. And then inside of the array, we'll have a bunch of different columns. Those will have their own name as well. So for example, it'll be like to do. 
And then they'll have tasks inside of here, which would be an array. And that can have like an ID, that can have a name, and that can have a description. We'll keep the field pretty simple. All right, so we save that. There you go, that's looking pretty good. And then let's go ahead and duplicate this a couple of times. And so we have to do, let's do like in progress and complete. And then as far as the task names go, we'll just keep this real simple, like task number one. And then let's do a couple of them in here, task two. And then, all right. So then actually, so this is kind of getting a little repetitive, right? So something that I wanted to show you through kind of scaffolding data, because that's something you have to do sometimes. Is so when you have multiple places where you need to increment something, so in say like the task, right? We're doing one, two, three, four, five. So rather than do it manually like this, what you can do is do a multiple cursor selector. I'm holding down command for Mac. Pretty sure it will happen with control if you're on Windows. And then we say we can do task number, for example, just like this. And so you see it updates multiple cursors, but then I'm gonna go ahead and select all of these now. So I'm gonna use command D to basically select all of the individual instances of that. And then there's this cool VS Code extension that I really love called Text Pastry. And Text Pastry allows you to basically do things like one to X, for example. So whoops, I realized I don't want to replace the whole thing. So let me switch that back. I want that cursor there one more time. And now you'll see it automatically generates that one, two, three, four, five, which is really lovely because essentially what that means is that you can do these really long lists and basically generate those numbers without manually typing it in. In addition, you might've seen a little sneak peek to one of my favorite aspects about text pastry, which is that when you need to generate a unique ID, yes, you can always hack one up together with like random numbers and stuff, but there should be an extension for that. It should be easier than that. So what we're going to go ahead and do here is going to take this ID property that we have in our data. And then inside of here, we're going to be using the text pastry UUID. And once you hit enter, you'll see that it actually generates, I actually don't even know how many characters it is, probably like 20 plus characters, random digits. I've never had an issue with it. And now you actually have real unique IDs to work with rather than just random integers that might accidentally clash as you're prototyping your data. And so just to show that, let's see, text pastry. So there you go. That's JK, just joshing. That's who the author is. A fantastic little hidden gem. One of my favorite VS Code extensions that I wanted to show you as part of this exercise. Okay, cool. So now that we have our board data, let me go ahead and actually shrink this a little bit. We're going to go ahead and actually use this inside of our board store. So the way we're going to do this is we're actually going to go ahead and import that board data. So I'm going to call it import board data from the data slash board dot JSON, just like that. And then the way this works when you're in a Pinia store using the composition API approach is that you essentially define all your normal reactive variables as you would in a normal composition API context. So what is state essentially? State is a reactive reference. So all we're going to do is we have a board that is going to be a ref. And what is that ref going to be? Well, we're just going to pass in board data. That's all we're going to do. So that would be the same as us defining that whole object on this page, but now it's very clearly modular so that in the future we can always modify it as needed. And then that said, remember, I said this is a function that returns something. We need to actually return a similar object pattern to before where we're actually returning what it is the store is exposing. So we're going to return what? We're going to return the board. That's basically all it is. And so this board is a reactive reference. So it's something that can be referenced later on, which we're going to do right now. So inside of our homepage, we're going to go ahead and let's see, let me go ahead and wrap this right now with a main element. And then I'm going to use the pre tag. I really love using this particular element just because it's helpful at displaying the data in a way that looks like JSON. And so of course we haven't imported the board yet. So now we go ahead and import use board store. Let's see. Actually, I think it sounded use board store. Perfect. See, see, this is the beauty of autocomplete. I absolutely love it. All right. Cons board store equals, whoop, I'll get that typo in a second. Use board store. And then now that we have that, this will basically be board store dot board because this board is a reactive reference of the actual store. So if we save that, let's jump into our app, switch up to local hosts and refresh and up. Oh, it's down because we forgot or I forgot that I actually killed the local dev server. Great. All right. So inside of here, Hey, you see it refresh and look at that. We have our JSON data. It's showing up. So we have our store working. This is great. Now that we have this, of course, a lot of times when you're building stuff, I know that it's very common for developers to just work with like the bare minimum as far as the UI and that kind of stuff. But in this particular course, we're going to actually be using a component library. In fact, it's a rather new one at the time of this recording, and that's called Nuxt UI Component Library. And so essentially, the Nuxt team went out and they said, look, component libraries, those are the things people need. 
let's go ahead and build one using the Nuxt ideology and kind of show what's possible with that. And what basically is, is as you expect from a component library, uh, they provide a bunch of stuff like accordions, alerts, avatars, basically to make your life a lot easier when it comes to scaffolding and prototyping your app so that you're not worried about styling and that kind of stuff. A couple of things to keep in mind though with this is that when you use the Nuxt UI component library, it does require you to basically use Tailwind CSS because that's basically their strategy for managing styles within the component library. And so if you haven't used Tailwind CSS or Utility CSS in general, no worries. I'll do like a high level crash course just to show you how it works and within the context of this app. So no worries. There. As long as you have basic understanding of CSS, you'll be just fine for this course. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and actually install this inside of our app. So we're going to use this npm install Nuxt UI. Going to stop the dev server again. And then npm install Nuxt UI. Let's go ahead and let that install. Cool. Now we'll go ahead and just like before, as I mentioned, since we're using a library that is specifically associated with Nux, we need to actually configure it within our Nux config. So this will be Nux flash UI save. Now, when we start up our local dev server, things should look a little bit different. Already you see use default Tailwind CSS file that's already being loaded. And so now we go ahead and jump over to our local host 3000. There you go. Boom. You'll notice, voila, not only are things sort of looking differently, you sort of have like a reset style that's happening. You'll notice that it actually automatically switched to the dark theme. And in case you're wondering how that's actually working, so underneath the hood, when you're looking at what Nux UI is, it actually also contains this module called color mode. And so Nux is essentially automatically detecting what your preferences are as far as themes go. And so it knows that I like dark themes, so therefore it switched to the tailwind dark mode. That said, this course is not about learning how to design or style things. So rather than have to deal with the theming of it, we're actually going to go ahead and just configure it to be light mode so that everyone's on the same page and then it'll look the same for everyone as far as this particular course. And so the way you actually do this is inside of the Nux config, since it actually has the Nux color mode module already installed underneath the hood, because it's a dependency basically of Nux UI, we're going to use the color mode, which you can see here auto completes. That's how you know it's available to you inside the config. Very, very useful because a lot of times in the past when you configure things, you're kind of guessing and hoping it works. But the autocomplete makes such a difference as far as knowing what's allowed for you to do. So inside of this color mode, you can basically define the preference that you start with. And so normally it's system preference, which is essentially what the user prefers. But we're going to just say it's going to be light. That's what we're going to say. And so now if we go back to our app, which I'll open up, local hosts through 1000 and refresh. Oh, I forgot. We need to actually reboot the server. Bum, bum, bum for this one. Okay. Oh, I think I know what's about to happen. Okay. Live debugging. What's going on? Well, one of the things about the code that basically helps you out with the color mode is that it'll actually save that preference within your application. So if we go inside of the application tab inside of your local storage, you'll see here inside of localhost 3000, that Nux color mode is currently being hard coded to system. And so if we go ahead and delete that key this time and then refresh. It'll actually then correctly go to that light preference mode we set. And then you'll notice this time it's actually setting it to light. And so we won't be getting into color mode and managing themes, but if you want to look more into it, you know where to die right in. Okay, cool. We have the light mode. Everything's working. This is great. Do do. All right. Now that we have that installed and configured, we have the foundation set up so we can go ahead and move on to the next part, which is building the UI for our app. So it looks a lot more like an actual Kanban board for users to interact with.